good is it? Good morning, everybody. It's very good to be here. Thank you again for uh, asking me to come. Uh, before we go any further, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, we thank you for the gifts and offerings that have just been collected. And we pray that with them, this church uh, would use them for your glory and the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray now as we uh, exercise our offering of love, our sacrifice to you, by opening your word together, and spending time looking into it, we pray that you would also reward us and provide the increase from your word that we would hear you speaking to each of us today and that you would uh, get into the hearts and minds of every individual here, including me, and help us as we talk and open your word together to be refreshed by it, challenged by it, and moved to be different. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. Paul mentioned something earlier, which I cannot let go uh, without commenting on. Adi and I were in the same year at school, and Paul wasn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, he was born in 1971, and I was born in 1970, which makes me older than Paul. And I'm not sure about Adi, but he could be a 69. Is that right? 70. Okay, so is about my age. Paul is much, much younger. <laughs> because Paul is younger, he has a grasp of technology, and I do not. So I have a survey of my own, and this survey is going to take place in your head, not on the screen. Uh, it's a bit old-fashioned, I know, but I want you to think of three things. I want you to think of three things that you would tell me you don't have to, and I'm not going to ask anyone to speak out loud. In your head, think of three things that you would tell me to explain to me who you are. Tell me something interesting about yourself that tells me about you and your character, your personality, you as a person. Think about this while I'm telling you this little story. A few years ago, quite a few years ago, I came on a course at Warwick University through my work. And with some colleagues and meeting with people from other companies, we sat through a number of sessions. I think there were about nine in all. We traveled down and spent two, three, four days at Warwick University, very pleasant, in their manufacturing um, training center. Uh, and so lots of people from industry gathered together. And there's one particular session where there's about 15, 16 of us. And whoever was leading the session said, I want you to sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and write down all the things you enjoy doing in life. And we did. We carried on. We wrote those lists. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some lists were longer than others. <clears throat> but we all wrote those lists. And the person leading the course at the end of those, at the end of that exercise, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I might have a, a dairy intolerance. That's this morning's coffee giving me some trouble. Um, so they asked us, right, OK, you've done these lists. Can you all tell me, bear in mind who we were and where we'd come from? How many of you have put work on your list? It may not surprise you to find out that none of us have put work on our list. You are allowed to enjoy work. It's just that when you're in a situation where you're basically at work, although you're somewhere else, you don't feel there's a need to talk about it. And that's probably why it didn't end up on the list, because that's the reason we were there. We took it for granted. So your three things, I hope you've got some. Is there anywhere in those three the fact that you are a Christian saved by grace and walking in God's way? I wonder if that's the case. Now, if it isn't there, that's not a problem, because just like me at Warwick University with my work colleagues and others, you are in a church surrounded by Christians. I'm a Christian. Hopefully you're a Christian. And if you're not, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you why you should be. Uh, but you're a, and so we sort of take that for granted. So it might not be in those three. However, in your mind, when you're out in the world, that should definitely be something that you identify with. We are in a series called the Wake Up series, and this is a, the, the, what we're going to look at today is how we're going to be different in the world. And our reading for today is taken from Matthew chapter 5. So if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 5 with me, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And we're going to read the very end part in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 11. We're going to read the very ending of the part that's entitled the Beatitudes. And we're going to read the first part of the bit that in my Bible is entitled the Similitudes, which I've never not come across before until I uh, took this Bible out of its box, uh, which it's been in for a little while. I uh, bought it a little while back. So you're very honored. This is the first time this has come out of my house. Um, but it's uh, it's uh, NIV. Um, and it's uh, is what, what is not a Thompson chain, Schofield. Um, I've not got the hang of it yet, but um, it's it's a useful it's a useful version uh, of the Bible. But it's it's hopefully in the same version as you're reading today, the NIV. So we've got the Beatitudes and the Similitudes, uh, Matthew chapter five, and we'll start at verse eleven, which reads as follows: Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We are called in this passage to be salt and light in the world. There are two types of people in this world, those that are saved by God's grace and those that are not. In this passage, we see that those of us that are saved by God's grace are like salt. This is where the word uh, simil uh, simile or similitude comes from. We are like salt. We are like light. We are different. We have been changed. I'm going to read out a few very short excerpts from a number of verses, which I'll read out, but don't turn to them because you'll be, you'll be trying to chase shadows. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, we read that we are dead to sin. In the same chapter, Romans 6 and verse 14, we read that we are not ruled by sin. A bit further on in Romans 12 and chapter 2, we've been transformed and renewed. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we read that we are chosen, that we're royal, that we are holy. These words describe people that are very different to the people of the world. Now, when we see that we're dead to sin, we're not ruled by sin, that doesn't mean to say that we don't sin. We all know that we sin. We all know that we fall short. We all know that we do things that are wrong, that grieve God. But what makes us different is that we're not ruled by that. When that happens in the life of a Christian, when we make mistakes, when we sin, it grieves us and we want to ask God for forgiveness. That's what sets Christians apart. It's simply that we're not ruled by sin. Those people in the world who are not saved can only sin. Everything they do is sin. They cannot please God. We can please God, but we can also use the will we have to choose to do the wrong thing. And that will come out a little bit later. But we're different. We're made different by God. God has made us his children, called us into his household. Uh, we are parts of, of his priesthood. And there's there's a, there's a problem there, isn't there? We we are we belong to God. We're different to everyone else. But because we're sat here this morning, we know that we are in the world. Now, I wonder whether you've ever come across the phrase "in the world but not of it." It's not a Bible quotation, but it is taken very simply from the Bible and is very clear doctrinally. And I'm going to read some parts of John, John chapter 17, where this phrase is built up from. <laughs> Uh, and you'll see that it's quite, it, you can see it straight away in scripture. But the problem with that phrase is that occasionally it's misunderstood. We're in the world, but not of the world. That does not mean we're in the world, but we don't want anything to do with it. It means we're in the world, but we're not of it. We are different. So in John 17, we come across what, what's called a high priestly prayer. And Jesus is praying not only for himself, but for his disciples and his followers. And what he talks about here when he prays, he, he prays to God and he says, 
in verse 11 of John 17, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. A bit later on, he says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. And then in verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated me for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So quite clearly, Jesus's desire for our life is to be in the world. And sometimes when we say we're in the world, but not of the world, that phrase we're in the world loses some of its power. What we have to grasp is that we are in the world. We are here and we have a job to do. The job to do is to remember that we're not of it, but don't forget that you are in it. Why, therefore, would Jesus ask that we should be left in the world? He was going, but we were staying here and ask for God's protection. Well, Jesus prayed that prayer so that we might not only remain in the world, but that we would be protected so that we could carry on doing the things that God wants us to do. And what is it that he wants us to do? Well, that's found in our reading in Matthew chapter 5. And the first part of verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. And also in verse 14, you are the light of the world. That's what God wants us to be. And we're going to look into that a little bit more and see what it means for us today. Salt and light. Two things that need to come into contact with something in order to do any good. You have to put salt on your food to make it tasty. You have to put salt around something if you want to use it as a preservative or to dry meat. I don't know if you like beef jerky, but that's how they dry beef jerky. They use a lot of salt. Um, light has to come into contact with things. There is light all around us because it not only comes straight from the sun, but it bounces off other things and gets into places where the sun isn't shining exactly, where you see a shadow. The sun is not shining on that spot, but you can see it. And you can see it because the light bounces all around. The light is in contact with things, and that's how, how we see. And salt also has to come into contact with things. Salt and light both have a strong influence on the things that they touch. We as Christians, as salt and light in this world, must have an influence on the world. The best picture I found is of a boat floating on a lake. The lake is made out of water. The boat is made out of, well, let's say wood. It could be any number of other things, including steel, which is very heavy, and yet a boat still floats on the water. The boat is not made out of water. Now, that sounds like an obvious thing to say. However, in the Second World War, they were making boats out of water, and they successfully floated boats in the fjords in Norway to try to aid the war effort. Uh, and they made boats out of something called picrete, which is incredibly bulletproof uh, and very strong and, and hardly melts at all if it's kept in water at the right temperature. And this guy, whose name was Pike, uh, came up with this, this stuff, or him and his friends came up with this stuff called picrete. Very, very interesting stuff. And they were going to make boats, and then nuclear came along, and they realized that ice boats in a nuclear battle were not going to last very long. So they gave up on the idea, but they had some success. But the boat we're thinking of is not made out of water. It is something different. It's made of something different to the water. It's not water. There's also something else you need to know about the boat. It doesn't have water in it. If you've got a boat with water in it, it's not going to stay a boat for very long. What do you do? You want to get the water out. The boat may have some holes in somewhere that might let water in, but your desire is to get the water out as quickly as possible. You see where I'm going with this. You're a Christian. You are made of something different to the rest of the world, the lake. You are the boat. You are something different. You don't want holes in, but sometimes we do get holes in. Your activity should be getting the world, the water, out of the boat. There are two other things you ought to know about a boat in water. Imagine a boat floating on a lake. You freeze the lake instantly. You lift the boat out. What do you see? There's a boat-shaped hole. There's an influence. The boat has an influence on the water. The, the boat pushes water out of the way, and the water reacts against that, and that's how boats work. That's how they float. The other thing is as the boat is moving about in the water, it's causing ripples. And the question is for us as Christians is, is our life, our boat, 
displacing the world, getting the world out, pushing the world away, floating, as it were, above the world, and yet still in contact with it, still making ripples. Is our Christian life making ripples in the world? Are we having an effect on people around us as we carry on being a boat, being a Christian? And all of that sums, is summed up in one word, is our position. And there's this three things we're going to talk about this morning. That's the first, our position in the world. Who are we? How do we identify? We should identify foremostly in all aspects of our life as a Christian. How do I go about being a Christian here, there, and everywhere? In everything we do, what is our position? How do we relate to the world around us? And our position is that of being salt and light, having an influence on the world around us. So that's our first point. Secondly, seeing our position in the world, what we come on to next is our production. So we've seen position. Now we've got production. In Matthew 5 and verse 16, the passage we read earlier, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, good deeds here is, is rather a broad subject. So we need to break that down a little bit and have a look at what good deeds are. What do they look like? Well, first of all, the Bible talks about good deeds. Some versions use the word charity, which is a word for love and translated as good deeds uh, in, in many versions. And in Hebrews chapter 13 and 16, we're challenged in this way. Don't forget to do good and to share what you have because God is pleased with these kinds of sacrifices. We need to give, we need to be loving, we need to show charity in a sacrificial manner. C.S. Lewis, who wrote a great series of books, The Lion, the Wish and the Wardrobe, has written other books as well, and some of them are full of great wisdom. wouldn't say I agree with all of C.S. Lewis's theology or his doctrine, uh, but however, he writes some good stuff, and this is challenging. He wrote this about sacrificial giving. I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. Now, that's, that is a little bit hard hitting. Um, but it's a great examination of ourselves. If you are with your peers, do you have all the things that they have? Uh, and the question is there that you have to ask yourself is, if I have all those things, clearly I could afford to give more in doing more for other people, in showing charity to others. So we must be sacrificial in our giving. The other thing about other things about uh, our giving and our, our good works is that they must bring glory to God. In Matthew chapter 6 and verses 1 to 4, just over the page from our, from our reading, we read the following words. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I read something on the internet that described this activity as invisible hands. Nobody sees what you do. Of course, if you do something nice for people, it's very difficult not to be seen by them. And if you're seen doing what you want to do, then that's not a problem. You've not broken the rules. However, you shouldn't do it for the purpose of being seen by others. You should do it for the glory of God, helping people out on the quiet, just doing the things that God wants you to do, acting in a way that God wants you to act as a boat in the water, making ripples around you. The other thing, is that the good deeds that we do should be wisely applied. The resources that God has given us in order to enable us to do good deeds for other people should be wisely applied. And we read some advice that Paul gave to Timothy in 1 Timothy in chapter 5. 
and starting at verse 3, he says this to Timothy, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for his relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, which we looked at last time, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble and devoting herself to all kinds of deeds. Now, not all of that is applicable to us today, and we would need to act with wisdom and discernment uh, rather than apply this uh, absolutely to the situations we find ourselves in. Uh, however, what it does show us is that we need to be careful and apply our good works, apply our charity in the right places in the right way, and not be careless uh, with the resources that God has given us to show his goodness to other people. Uh, we should show wisdom. And lastly, uh, the last thing that, that we should think about when we're doing good deeds is there must be faith involved. And there's a verse uh, in, in James chapter 2. We have the following. James chapter 2, verse 15. Suppose, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Our Christianity means that we have a faith in God. Our faith in God should come with good works. And so therefore, our good works as a Christian, quite naturally, come from our faith in God. We need to do our good works in the way that God wants us to do our good work. So that's about charity, good works that are charitable, doing good things for other people, helping other people out, and the things that we need to apply from Scripture while we're doing those things. What else does the Bible tell us are good works? The fruits of the Spirit are evidence of our good works. Um, let me just find that reading. Galatians 5, Galatians 5 and verses 22 and 23 say the following. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, mostly internal, but they can have an effect on people around us. But then the following, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, and I believe that means both to God and man, gentleness, which is definitely man to man, and self-control, which has a very great effect on the people around us. Most of the fruits of the Spirit, as described there, that should sum us up as Christians, have a great effect on the people around us, both those that are Christians and the non-Christians particularly, that are looking on and watching us day by day. So we've seen charitable needs and the rules, as it were, from the Bible that, that uh, tell us how we should uh, administer those. We've seen the fruits of the Spirit. These are all things that we do. This is the way we act. This is what we're seen to be getting involved in. But there's also a call for us as Christians to also act by omitting certain things. So there are certain things that we should produce as Christians, but there are certain things that we shouldn't produce either. And in uh, Matthew chapter 5, I turn back to that, we see the rest of those verses talking about salt and light. In verse 13, the second half of verse 13, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, this is one of those statements that's a bit like, did you know a swan can break your arm and his wing? Um, and you find out that nobody you've ever met and you've ever heard of has ever had their arm broken with a by, by the wing of a, of a swan, but apparently, theoretically, it's correct. Theoretically, I'm not sure that salt can ever lose its saltiness. This is a ridiculous situation. And these people, I don't think, were aware of gritting the roads in the winter. 
uh, because of where they lived. Uh, but even as you might read that into it, but I don't think it's there. Uh, salt that isn't salty isn't there. It doesn't exist. We do definitely not need to be people who have lost our saltiness. There's a massive call there for us to continue being salty in the world in which we're in. And it says in verse 14, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Don't put your light under a bowl. It doesn't need to be hidden. It should be giving light. That's its job. And when you light a light, you don't then cover it over uh, because you don't want that light to get out. The very purpose of you putting the light on is for it to shine around. Don't stop doing the things that make you light and salt in the world around you. Do not compromise. We need to refuse to join in with the world when it suggests we should be something other than what the Bible tells us uh, to do. We need to refuse to join in. We need to stand up uh, and be counted. Now, this does not mean that we need to be offensive. We do not need to ram the gospel down people's necks. This is a part of this study that I struggled with the most. As you read about being salt and light in the world, it tells you to be salt and light in the world by doing what? Good deeds, helping people out, showing people the love of God by what you do. And nowhere in that verse does it tell you to go on the attack. This is difficult. Uh, and this is something that I struggle with because that's not necessarily where my head was before I started looking at this. Let me read you something else. Now, there's a very famous passage in the Bible that, if anything, was going to talk about having a scrap. This is it. And it's found in Galatians, uh, sorry, it's found in Ephesians and chapter six. And as I start reading, you'll realize this. If you've been a Christian for a while, you will know what this passage is on about. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and then it carries on, if you're not looking at your Bible, you might think what's coming next, with a sword in your hand and a helmet on your head and a breastplate and feet ready uh, and shod with something suitable, what do you think that you are ready for? And as a boy... Uh, I think, right, you're up for it. This is going to be a fight. This is going to be a scrap. We're going to get stuck in. We're going to wade in and we're going to, you know, take Christianity everywhere. It doesn't say that. And when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. At the best, you could say that that man equipped with the armor of God is ready to defend himself. There is self-defense. When whatever is going on has gone on, you are still standing. You have survived, but you've not gone on the attack. And the more I looked at this, I really wanted to find something that said the opposite to that, but I couldn't find it anywhere. We should be ready to defend the faith. Uh, it may cost a great deal uh, for us to do that, but we should be ready to defend the faith. We don't need to be on the attack, going out there and looking for a scrap with people, we want to carry on quietly and calmly doing what we should do, following the example of Jesus. When Jesus came across people who were anti him, he, he did use some very, very strong language, and even at one point made a whip and beat people out of the house of God. But that's what he was doing. He was defending his position and coming up with words and actions that defended the faith. He wasn't going out looking for trouble because trouble came to him. And the armor of God suggests that we put that on so that we might defend ourselves. And in so doing, we're doing God's will by doing that. So we don't need to be offensive. Um, the last thing that, br that brings us on to quite naturally is, is the work of spreading the gospel. So we've seen charitable deeds, we've seen the fruits of the spirit, we've seen our acts of omission, what we don't do. The last thing is taking the gospel into all the world, which is what the Bible asks us to do, what God asks us to do, the great commission. And when we take the gospel into the world, we are simply taking it, as we've already seen, by doing what is right. 
But there comes times, hopefully, as we pray and we go into our workplaces with our families and neighbours, that an occasion crops up where you can quite literally just share the Bible with people. This is also a very good work. Man needs to know God. Man will not get to know God unless he is preached to. And that is our job as Christians, not just the preacher at the front, but all of us in our life to life, in our day to day being. We need to be people who are ready to share the gospel. We witness by our charitable deeds. And we, the Bible tells us in, in Matthew 5 that that brings glory to God. We witness to people by demonstrating the, fruit as the, the fruits of the spirit. But the only way to get people to know Jesus and to know God is, is for them to get to know his, his word. And we are the people that have to carry that with us. So that's the last of the good deeds, as it were, taking the gospel into the world. What happens when we do these things? Well, the reason I ordered them in that way is because our next point, we've seen our position in the world. We've seen what we should produce or what we shouldn't produce, our production. Here we come across persecution. Blessed are you, it says in Matthew 5, verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. How does persecution manifest itself in our lives? There are some people in this country um, who, and, and the Christian Institute is one of them, that, that don't like using the word persecution. They feel that if we use the word persecution, we sort of downgrade what's happening to people on the other side of the world who are literally being killed, locked up, having their possessions taken off them because they are Christians. There are people in the world who are suffering very, very severe persecution. But we should not expect to get away with it scot-free just because we live in a country that is more liberal. We should thank God that we have the right to meet on a Sunday morning and talk about the Bible and that we're not under pressure from the police or anyone else not to do what we're doing this morning. We should thank God for that because we, are ex we have a freedom in this country, uh, which is, is, well, quite literally second to none. Um, however, as we go about our lives, that doesn't mean to say that we're not going to meet with some opposition to what we do. And so the order that I've talked about those things in, as, as in the good works that we produce, are, are, are sort of an increasing, are going to, were done, it was done like that to, to, to show an ever-increasing growth in the amount of persecution that we might face for doing those things. If you do good deeds for other people, it's highly likely that the world is going to support you in that up to a point. Uh, however, there will be a few, a small minority in our society that don't like that. And why? Because it shows them up for what they're not doing. The, video, the, 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 the bit we wrote, uh, read about the widows, the widow's family should look after the widows. If you're looking after a widow and their families stood there looking on, they might not enjoy your interference. It shows them up for what they should be doing. How about the gifts of the spirit? If you go into work and act and demonstrate the gifts of the spirit day in, day out, it may be that you start to get a little bit teased by people who see you as very, very different. God says, don't worry about that. You carry on doing the fruits of the spirit day in, day out, and let people watch you because by doing that, you're bringing glory to God. If you refuse to join in, these are the acts of omission, your good deeds of not doing some things, you are definitely going to get some resistance. If you stand up and tell people what the Bible says about all sorts of subjects, you are going to get some resistance. And then finally, when you present the gospel, that final good work, the greatest good work that you can ever do, you are certainly going to almost always meet with some resistance. Even those people that have heard the gospel and eventually become Christians in that, those first contacts are very, very often anti what you're trying to tell them. And the work of the spirit and the word slowly works in their lives and brings them around to a way of thinking that tells them that they need, there's something in life that they need to grab hold of. And so we may come under persecution for doing any of those good works. And in Matthew 5, we see that you're blessed if people persecute you. Why? Because God's asked you to do it. And if you're getting persecuted for it, clearly you're doing a good job of it because it's having an effect. It's causing ripples in, in the world around you. And that's what you want to be doing. 
So in Matthew 5 and 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. You know, the persecution is included in there, but also around it, insults and say all kinds of evil against you. When we go into the world and we, and we demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit, we might find that people take advantage of our kindness. They take advantage of our patience and our long-suffering. They might make us the, the, the subject of their sport because we're not going to retaliate. They realize that they can take the mickey a little bit more than perhaps they would with anyone else who, who was a member of a, of a particular club or supported a particular football team. When at, I work in Derby and live in Nottingham, uh, it's a bit like Coventry in Birmingham. You know, there's Aston Villa and there's Coventry City Football Club. Um, and if you support one or the other, but work in the opposite place, you know you're going to get some tonk for that. Um, however, I don't support Nottingham Forest, by the way, just to let you know, or county for that matter. But there are also then stereotypes. So when people, rather than taking the mickey out of you because you support the wrong football team, if you're a Christian and they're not, there's a little bit more venom in what they're saying against you when they do. That, of course, gives you an invitation, doesn't it, as Jesus, as we follow Jesus' example, to get stuck in and defend yourself uh, by hopefully saying something that's going to have an effect on them spiritually for eternity. Stereotypes in the media. I was thinking of the, the vicar. You know, whenever there's a vicar in a cartoon or, or a film or anything, they're always a bit drippy, aren't they? And this is the way the world sees the church. Uh, and it's it's a constant feed of that stuff. I mean, there are some good vicars on the telly, but, you know, a lot of them are not very good. There's a constant reduction in our freedoms as Christians, laws that are passed. And society as a whole puts a massive pressure on us to lighten up and, and not to be quite so Christian as we interact with the world because it's, well, it's just not very, it's not very welcoming. It's not very liberal. Uh, and we're expected to, to, to bow down to the LGBT community. We're expected to be woke. This is a new word that's come look it up when you, when you get home. We're expected to do what society wants us to do. And there comes a point where we have to stand up against that. One example of this, to finish with, is emails at work. It would appear that there is a growing need for me as Edward Neat or Eddie to put Mr. in front of my name on an email. And the reason for that is so that people who might be identifying as, for example, Mrs. Eddie Neat can put that on their emails to know who they are identifying as. Now, this is very useful when you deal with people from all around the world. One lady on Friday whose name was spelt Y G O N G Y. I still don't know how to pronounce it. Fortunately, her photo is on the email, so I can see it's, it's, it's a lady. But that, that therefore, putting Mr. in front of Eddie Neat is, is not a problem to me. I know why it's there because of, of uh, people with gender identity issues and the need for us to be inclusive of those people. I'm not doing it for that reason, and I don't think that goes against Scripture. However, what is happening on a number of emails in my company at the moment is the LGBT rainbow being drawn along underneath, underneath their signature. I won't do that. I'm not going to do that. And, and in all reality, it is probably unlikely, but it could cost me my job. But I'm not going to do that. Why not? Because I don't support that movement. Uh, and the Bible tells me that I shouldn't. And so, therefore, I need to stand up against that. I need to defend the gospel. I need to defend my rights as a Christian to believe what God has put in his word. And I don't mind writing Mr. Eddie Neat if it comes to that, but, but not the rainbow underneath, because that is a step too far. And I may need to stand up against that. So, in conclusion, we need to remember who we are. What is our position in the world? We need to make sure that our production is good works. And we also need to realize and be ready for persecution when it comes. Uh, and if we do those things, read the word, daily take up his cross, daily take your stand against the world and, and its influences on us. Continue floating above the water 
touching the water, being in the water, but as a boat floating above the water, throwing water out when it comes in, making sure that you continue to make ripples in the world because of your good works. Keep on doing good works because that is what God demands of us. We're going to sing uh, to close uh, in Christ alone.